And welcome back to the Illuminations Media Member section. We have our excellent guest, Anthony Peake, who's discussing his, his world staggering book. And I'm just so excited to grab it. The Infinite Minefield, The Quest to Find the Gateway to Higher Consciousness. And you know, that's what this is all about. It's about raising that consciousness. So Anthony, welcome back. Let's pick up where we left off. We were actually speaking about DMT, that molecule that comes from that pineal gland. Absolutely. I mean, one of the um, the most fascinating um, discoveries I made in recent years was, was was reading a series of books on dimethyltryptamine and ayahuasca. Um, maybe if we, 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 we move into ayahuasca, and then I'll move in from ayahuasca into the um, the uh, ethnobotany of it all, and then into the neurology and how where there is evidence that DMT is created in the brain. Um, dimethyltryptamine is probably one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, hallucinogens ever discovered. Um, but on top of this, it is generally not called an hallucinogen. The technical term is an entheogen. And it's called an entheogen because the word entheogen means God inside. And people believe that when you take dimethyltryptamine, you, you, you encounter something deep within yourself that is your own divinity, that is, is, your, is part of God that's inside you. Now, one of the fascinating things about DMT is that it has been known for many centuries by various civilizations around the world under different formats. And again, in the book, as part of my journey through history, I discuss the way in which certain substances have been, have been used to open up the higher self, open up the mind, open up into the inner world of consciousness. And I'm reminded of substances such as Soma, uh, which was, was very, very popular in the, the Indo-European nations and in very much the, the Aryans in Iran and places like that. Then you have a substance called Kaikion, which was used by the ancient Greeks, the Eleusian Mysteries. The, and again, this was supposed to be a substance that was, was drunk and, and people went into alternate states of reality. And in fact, the word ambrosia also has the same roots, the food of the gods. It's also substances that you can take that allow you to become a god or think like a god or perceive like a god. But the most fascinating area of this is uh, the ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is a, a drink, a brew, that is made in, in uh, Latin America, and particularly in Amazonia, in Peru and northern Brazil. And what ayahuasca is, is uh, a mixture of two plants that are found in Amazonia, uh, a substance called Banisteria, Banisteriopsis, Banisteria, Banisteriopsis capi uh, and Psychiotra viridas. Now, these two plants are mixed together. And when they are mixed together, they create this brew called ayahuasca. Now, what is intriguing about ayahuasca is that there are somewhere in the region of at least 50,000 separate plants in, and the Amazon, in, the, in Amazon. Of those, the shamans picked two to mix together in a very specific format to create ayahuasca. When they were asked by the anthropologists why they picked these two plants, the response was quite specific. They said, the plants told us to. And of course, shamans are able to take themselves into alternate states of consciousness by just going into trance states. That's why they're shamans. 
when the shamans went into the trance states, they would encounter creatures in their trance states, in their shamanic traveling. Generally, the, tra the beings that they would encounter would be snakes, large snakes. And the snakes would, and it was the snakes that said, take these two plants and mix them together because this will allow other people, non-shamans, to uh, appreciate your world. Now, what is intriguing about the two plants is one of them contains DMT. And I think it's the, the uh, I, I'm never quite sure which one contains DMT and which one doesn't, but one of the two contains DMT. If you, the, if you took this plant, I think it's Psychiatra viridas, if you took the plant and you chewed it and swallowed it and it went into your stomach, it would have absolutely no effect, even though it contains DMT. The reason it wouldn't have any effect is inside your stomach is an enzyme called MAO. And MAO, it literally inhibits and stops the DMT going in from the stomach into the bloodstream. It literally stops it. However, the Banisterius capi has in it something called an MAO inhibitor. So within that is a chemical that stops the MAO stopping the DMT going into the bloodstream. The shamans knew this. How did they know this? If they were just having an hallucination whereby they were just encountering beings in their dreams, how did those beings know that? It is clear that these beings that communicated to them knew because they are actual real entities that exist in, in intradimensional space. And they were using the shamans to allow themselves to come through into this world via the ayahuasca plant. Because people who take ayahuasca, one of the major things they describe are snakes. They see snakes. Snakes talk to them. One of the most famous books on this is written by a guy called Jeremy Narby. And in this book, Jeremy Narby describes the snakes communicating with him. The snakes are DNA. The snakes are the symbols of our own DNA communicating with us. It's the DNA wanting us to communicate with itself. Yeah. Which is fascinating. Yes, it, it, it really gets, is. Well, it gets even more intriguing now because <laughs> it has long been suggested that DMT is a very strange substance. It's found in virtually everything. It's virtually everywhere. In fact, one, one researcher jokingly said, it's more surprising to find something that doesn't have DMT in it. Now, right. DMT is, com and it's completely and utterly natural, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, they, they discovered DMT, dimethyltryptamine, inside human blood. They then found it in the, I think I'm right, in the lining of the intestine. So there was suddenly this thought, it's in the human body. It's already in there. It's already there, yeah. Right, and then they discovered it in dead brain material. They found traces of DMT in brain samples. But the major mystery was they've never ever found DMT in a live brain, okay? And in fact, when Rick Strassman wrote his famous book, The DMT, The Spirit Molecule, just a little bit of a background here. Rick Strassman in the late 1980s, early 1990s was given a grant by the American government to do research into DMT. In fact, he had volunteers who took doses of DMT to describe what experiences they had. Now, what is intriguing with the, and it, was, it all happens at the University of Mexico, Strassman is a psychiatrist at the University of Mexico, New Mexico. What they described was effectively seeing beings like greys. So again, we're going back to almost the abductee, the UFO abduction thing. Sure. Um, so we're starting to get into some very, very interesting areas of overlap here in terms of the UFO phenomenon, in terms of even experiences with entities, goblins, um, wraiths, ghosts, and everything else. These creatures are, 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 are very, very similar in terms of typology. In fact, Anthony. for instance, if you, take, if you read the work of Alistair Crowley, the, mm -hmm. the black magician, uh, right. he encountered a being called Awas during one of his um, trips, as it were. 
If you look at his drawings of Awas, and you look at the cover of uh, Brin, um, uh, Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, you look at the two images, they're virtually identical. It's the same type of creature. The greys right. that, from the entities right. in ufology are linked in some way to DMT and some way to this kind of communication. But what is absolutely amazing is very, very recently, and this is very recent news, and I think I'm the first writer to write about this piece of information in a, a mainstream book, in fact, any book, I think, is that a few, about two or three months ago, a researcher called um, Gimo Borogin at the University of, I think it was Minnesota, Minneapolis, something like that, actually discovered in the brain of live rats, live rats, dimethyltryptamine, in the pineal gland of live rats. The reason they do work on rats is that rats, the, the, the structure of the rat's brain in terms of its, um, its chemical constituents and the way the neurotransmitters work is very similar to the human brain. They have found DMT in a live brain. If it's in a rat's brain, it's in our brain. Chances are. If it's in our brain, it means it's endogenous. And they've yeah. also found it is created by the pineal gland. This is a massive, massive, massive earth-changing, world-changing discovery. And Anthony, something that has just come into my mind with all of your descriptions and the authors who have written about this concept of serpents and, and beings, uh, after taking a substance, well, it takes me to another book, the Bible, where yes. we oh. we see that Adam and Eve um, were interacting with the snake, who told them, "If you if you eat this, you will see and perceive as gods." Yes, correct. There's even more to this. I'm glad you brought that subject up. One of the people that I interview um, for the book and actually take a lot of his work is, is a rabbi by the name of Joel Baxt. And Joel Baxt lives in, um, in Colorado, Manitou Springs in Colorado. And he has, he has been studying the Torah and the Kabbalah since he was a child. He's, he's one of world's leading authorities on the Kabbalah and the Torah. And Joel, actually, Joel and I have come to almost the same conclusions. And Joel does the, the, the Kabbalistic stuff about the Old Testament. And he has found evidence of the pineal gland in the Old Testament. And get this, this is really fascinating. Do you remember the, the story of Jacob's ladder? Yes. Okay, and the burning bush and everything. Yes. The place that Jacob's, Jacob saw the hallucination of the ladder in Hebrew is called Pineal. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Joel's, Joel's concept is called the, P2, the P2P concept. Pineal to Pineal. And he believes that the derivatives of the word are identical and that the linkage here is in plain sight. He's also found there are sections of the Torah that I cite in the book that Joel has described to me in which the serpent is actually described directly in the Torah. So here we have the serpent, serpent symbolism here. But of course the great serpent symbolism is the, the Kundalini experience itself. Right. You know, the Kundalini is supposed to be a serpent or a snake rising up from the bottom of the spine up through and straight up into the brain to reach enlightenment. So the snakes are the symbols of this enlightenment. And the snakes, I think, go right back to the Ananikai in Samaria. And I think the Ananikai in Samaria, the Ananikai in Samaria were exactly the same. They were snake-like. If you look at the snake symbols and right through mythology, this symbolism is continually there. It is always there. It is. It is. So that there is definitely a linkage here. There is. Now, if the, and if dimethyltryptamine 
is created in the brain and it is completely and utterly natural. Rick Strassman has suggested, and I suggest in my book, dimethyltryptamine is the modulator of reality. It is dimethyltryptamine that creates the external reality that we see. In other words, we are existing in a dimethyltryptamine hallucination that is generated by DMT, which is created from information found in the zero point field and the light within the zero point field. So this is how we modulate and process the reality we see. When we take dimethyltryptamine, it breaks down the perceptual barriers and opens up our abilities to see the reality as it really is. The idea of the reality behind the reality, the old Gnostic idea of the plurama behind the visual illusion that is this world. So here we have even the Gnostic belief systems. It oh, goes on right and there. on. This, this book links everything. Yes. Now, Anthony, that takes me to alternate parallel realities. That yep. here you are. You know, you and I, you know, you're, you're there in the United Kingdom. I'm here in Seattle, Washington. And we're here interacting in real time, as they say. But then, of course, we go to sleep at night and we dream. And we have real experiences when we're dreaming. Are these parallel realities or is one of the realities not real? What do well, you that's think? the thing. It's how rooted can you go in this? You know, <laughs> people, turn, people turn around to me and they say, the reality that we perceive, that you and I share, and we share with all our fellow human beings, is called consensual reality. And the reason we, we believe it to be the real reality is because you and I both share the same things. You know, we can go out together and we, we will see something and we will agree that we saw a red rose right. in a garden. So because we both see that red rose, we believe that that is evidence that that external reality is real. There's two things here that I'd like to, 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 to focus in on. The first one is that there is now evidence and strong evidence and people have told me time and time again that when people are either taking ayahuasca, taking LSD, generally lucid dreaming, they have shared lucid dreams where they go into a lucid dream state and they meet somebody else. And they report back when they come back from the dream state and they report back exactly the same things. If that is the case, that means that the dream reality that was experienced by those people is as consensual as this reality, in which case the criteria we apply to tell ourselves that this is real, i.e. we share it with somebody else, you can share it in a dream state, which means it's just as real. The second point is that if this universe is my creation of my mind, Everybody else would agree with me about what they see because they're right. all part of my universe, if that makes sense. <laughs> it does. So in which case, if you meet somebody in a dream, which supposedly is a creation of your own subconscious, you will guarantee that you can't tell you're dreaming because everybody you encounter in a dream also shares that reality and sees the same things you see in your dream. So we, we now have to think a little bit more deeper about exactly when we, what we think about when we talk about dreaming, and particularly lucid dreaming. It is a state we go into, and it is an alternate state of consciousness. People I know lucid dream, and they go back to the same places, and they walk around the same places, and they discover things about those places. These things are consistent. I don't know about you, but I have reoccurring dreams of the same place. I go to the same place. It's somewhere I've never been in this reality, but it's a place that's just as real to me right. when I dream. Right. And, and just to go back just a, just a little bit, that the melatonin, certainly, yes. you know, when it gets dark, that's when the, the pineal begins to secrete that, and that's when we go to sleep. But then the other, that, that DMT, which is also that brain chemistry, it's also excreted, but at a different time with a different type of experience. Yes, or at the same time. You know, sometimes they can work, work concurrently because, interestingly ah. enough, the DMT and melatonin are very, very close. They're both tryptamines. So okay. chemically, they are very close to each other. 
so in which case that, that in fact there is an associate of mine called Beach Barrett who has suggested that the endogenous internally generated DMT should actually be called metatonin. So we have melatonin and metatonin. Mm-hmm. Now, if, melato- if, if, if DMT creates a kind of an illusory reality, this would explain things such as sleep paralysis, where the, the melatonin and the DMT are almost in conflict with each other in the sense that the melatonin is waking you want to go to sleep, but the DMT is creating the breakdown of this reality or the, the veil of this reality has been broken down by the DMT and breaking into the next reality behind. So that's why we have these kind of really strange hypno, hypnagogic or hypnopompic imageries just as we go to sleep and as we wake up. And again, in the book, I have a whole section on hypnagogia and that kind of liminal dream state where you can manipulate your dreams almost because you're in control, because the melatonin and the metatonin are in balance. Uh-huh. Because they're in balance, you can, you can manipulate that reality. And I think this is what lucid dreamers can do. Lucid dreamers can, can balance the melatonin balance. Now, one thing before I forget, which is even more intriguing, is that the ancient... Um, Buddhists or the Buddhists believe that the soul enters the human body at the 49th day of gestation. Okay, it's a general belief in, in Buddhism. Intriguingly, at the 49th day of gestation, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland are a single unit and it sits at the back of the throat of the embryo. Okay. As the baby grows and as it becomes more mature, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland move up from the back of the throat to the center of the head where they finally stay. There is a theory that when they move up there, they've left a very tiny little duct that runs to the back of the throat. Now, if DMT is excreted by the pineal gland, it could mean on occasions some DMT can drip down the back of the throat. Now, there is a process called Kekara Mudra, and Kekara Mudra is what mystics do in, in the Far East. And what they do is they clip their tongue right back to the back of their throat so they can taste what they call the divine nectar. The divine nectar that they believe is divine nectar, that acidic taste, is literally endogenous DMT dripping down the back of the throat and being tasted. This is how powerful this hypothesis is. It, it, it can be taken from so many different angles. And what I also believe is that we then link this to the zero point field and accessing alternate universes that are already in existence. In other words, with the Everett's Many Worlds interpretation of particle physics, suggests that every, every universe that could be exists somewhere and it's encoded. If it's encoded in the zero point field, it means we're existing in a huge, huge, huge computer program. <laughs> it's binary, it's digital. The digital information is encoded in the zero point field. The human brain facilitated by DMT accesses the database of the zero point field depending on which route you take is which universe you go into. The Akashic Record have anything to do with this? The Akashic Record is the same thing. Yeah, the Akashic ah. Record is the original version, the Vedic description of the, the field, the information that's out there. What Irvin Laszlo and uh, Bernard Haish and various other researchers have said is that the Akashic field it creates, it's, it's a computer program, it's a huge database. But what is even more intriguing is that this hypothesis, my hypothesis and the ideas of various other writers in this field, we are suggesting that human consciousness is just part of one great consciousness, which is effectively God. And we are part of that. And again, it's the teaching of all the religions, isn't it? Look for God within. (laughs) Find the God within you. The God within can be found through entheogens, 
Remember I said earlier on, entheogens are drugs that actually give you access to the God within. Right. DMT right. gives you access to your own godliness inside yourself. Because all we need to do is to discover that we are but shards of God. We are, we are something, we have something deep inside ourselves, which is part of a greater something. It's just we have forgotten of what we are. Do you, have you ever heard the Bill Hicks monologue? You know Bill Hicks, the American comedian? Yeah. We you know, he did a very famous monologue where he turned around and he said, breaking news, young man on LSD discovers that, what was it now, Ma matter is energy moved to a slow vibrational state and that we are all one entity experiencing ourselves subjectively. Oh. How right that guy was. <laughs> and you shall be as God. There it is. Yep. <laughs> it's the teachings of all the religions. It's the teachings specifically of the Gnostic Christians, the Sufis, the Kabbalists, all the mystery schools, the secret mystery schools of the great religions teach this. Buddhism always teaches it. So does Jainism, so does uh, Hinduism. Hinduism has this contrast contra of, of Brahman. You know, the, yeah. the entity that is everything. In the okay. Kabbalah, it's the or aim sof, the, the everything that is everything. That is the computer program. Right, and Brahman is dreaming everything, everything right? Brahman, Brahman? Is, is, Brahman is dreaming reality. He's dreaming all of this. Yes. <laughs> and if he falls asleep, everything ends. Yeah. I love this. Oh, this is fantastic. Oh, Thank my you. goodness. Now, this takes me to uh, another, and, and I will just go on and on <laughs> with these. Please do. I've, speak, I've spoken enough. Go on. This is just so beautiful. I mean, the expression of it. I, I would hope that, you know, in all of your studies, that uh, you've probably gotten into the, the minds of some of the people and some of their experiences, that they get this unworldly wisdom what are some of the things that people have come back with in terms of information yes Th that thing this, this fascinates me and in my book the daemon a guide to your extraordinary seat and secret self i didn't know where i was going to go with this mm -hmm. in the sense that at that stage i very much was of the opinion that we all are two entities there is our higher self our hidden self and there's our everyday self, and the hidden self has much more information available to it. Oh, yeah. And I believe now that the hidden self, what I call the daemon, the higher self, that voice in your head that warns you not to do things, the, the, the muse that, that, that makes people creative, the muse that, you know, for instance, um, Rudyard Kipling claimed that all his stories were effectively dictated to him by a voice in his head, which he called his daemon. Sometimes when, when I write, for instance, I find the same kind of thing. This comes out of me. It's almost like it's a, a kind of possession, a spirit guide, a seizure. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, one of the things in my books I'm fascinated in is temporal lobe epilepsy. And the way in which temporal lobe epilepsy seems to open up these channels of communication with the higher self, with the part of you that is God. Now, again, if you look at the word seizure, what does seizure mean? It means to be seized to be yes. taken, to be grabbed, to be taken control of. The muse takes control of people, you know, when people are writing. Clearly, that there is lots and lots of evidence for this kind of sensation. I also believe that people can access the future under these circumstances. I think that because, the, because of the way in which the zero-point field, the Akashic field works, of course, time is an illusion created by the mind to make stop everything happening at the same moment. And I believe that, and I discuss this again in my book, The Labyrinth of Time, I spend 380 pages discussing the mysteries, the philosophy, and the neurology of time perception. So in fact, if anybody wants to really understand where I'm coming from, if they reread my four or five books and then read this one, you will see how my ideas have been there all the time, and even I wasn't aware of where I was going. In other words, I started this journey not just arbitrarily going off in one direction without ever realizing that there was an end plan 
that, that, that everything I was writing five or six years ago has meaning for what I'm writing now that I did not see at the time. Which I That's find... the process of life, yes? Yeah? yeah, I find it staggering. For instance, one of the things that really amazes me is that my book, the Philip K. Dick book, the biography of Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer, oh. I was asked to write that by my publisher. I didn't pitch for it. They approached me and said, we'd love you to write a biography of Philip K. Dick. It will open you up to a new market. More people will be interested in you because you know a little bit about the guy. After I re I'd just finished The Infinite Minefield, I start writing Philip K. Dick, reading everything about him, all his letters, the whole thing, interviewing people that knew him. And I started to find elements of The Infinite Minefield were actually manifesting in Philip K. Dick's life. Oh, wow. Things I'd written about, Philip K. Dick had been writing about. And it suddenly was, my word, this is a huge jigsaw puzzle, and the bits are all there, and I'm putting them together. Talk <laughs> you know. about parallel realities. Oh, totally. You know, I find, <laughs> I find most of the time, I, 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 I pinch myself. I cannot believe. I get so excited about the things that are falling into place. And I can't understand why me? Why, why am I pulling this together? And that's not being vain. That is a genuine mystery. It's as if all the books I've read ever since I was a child have given me the information I need now to pull it all together. But yeah. then again, if it's my universe, that would happen anyway, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, but Anthony, I'm in it too. And I can tell you why you. Because nobody else could do it the way that you're doing it. That's why. Well, thank you. That's very <laughs> kind of you to say. I'm not responsible for the truth, just the challenge. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's very now, nice to say. Anthony, let's let's take a look. I heard you speak about a, a machine, a machine that can actually take you into that hypnagogic experience. And yes. and I know that we certainly have chemicals in our brain. Uh, that create that. We spoke about the DMT and uh, the melatonin. But how could a machine create this experience? Right. This is where it gets really, really, really curious. I'm um, ready. The, the, machine, the, meaning, the machine in question um, was originally called the hypnagogic light machine um, and then became known as the hypnagogic light experience. Um, it was invented by an Austrian psychiatrist, psychologist called Dr. Um, Engelbert Winkler and a, an Austrian a consultant neurologist uh, called Dr. Dirk Prokol. And many years, about five or six years ago, Engelbert Winkler read my first book, Is There Life After Death? And he was blown away by it because he'd had a near-death experience when he was a child. And he had trained as a consultant psychologist, basically to try and understand the experience he had when he was a child. And he started to realize that his patients reacted very positively to certain types of light. And he then got talking to an old friend of his, uh, Dirk Prokol, who's a consultant neurologist who understands how the brain functions. And the two of them got together to try and devise a machine effectively to relax their clients during sessions. But they found that the machine they could play with, and they could play with intensities of light, stroboscopic lights, and various other things that could generate altered states of consciousness and even out-of-the-body experiences. And they invited me over to Switzerland four years ago to test this machine out. This was before I'd written any of my latest books. I'd written just the, the Damon and uh, Is the Life After Death at that stage. And this machine, I tested it, and it blew my mind, literally. I could not believe what happened to me. Um, I, I, was, I was coming out of my body. I saw the, uh, well, for want of a better word, the, the Castanada lights of the world, the blue lights of the world. I saw, I felt I was hovering over a planet, uh, looking down. But I also discovered that after the session had finished that I could sense a movement in the center of my forehead, which seemed to be coming from deep inside my brain. And I believed at that time that the light had actually engendered something deep within me. 
And of course, at that time, I wasn't aware it was my pineal gland. And that night, I had dreams of snakes, which, again, I had not joined the dots because I didn't have the dots to join, but it's only subsequently that I see the symbolism with the snakes, like Jeremy Narby saw the symbolism with the snakes. Now, the Lucid Light device now, um, they are now manufacturing them and assembling them and selling them. Uh, and people can now buy these machines. Um, and there is a distributor in New York. I think there's a distributor in L.A. Um, I think there is another one somewhere in the center of the USA. Uh, and these machines can be bought. And everybody that, and I mean everybody, that uses these machines has an experience. Now, what I believe is happening, and again, I'm working with the two doctors on this, and they are of the same opinion, we believe that the light stimulates the pineal gland to excrete DMT. Okay. It, it does it literally. You look at the light, the flashing and everything else stimulates the pineal gland and it excretes dimethyltryptamine and gives you a DMT trip. Very, very interesting. Well, I know a lot of our listeners will definitely want to get a hold of one of those machines and to have that experience um, because certainly the, the drug, uh, ayahuasca, the DMT, whatever it is, is illegal. In fact, uh, Graham Hancock got into some deep trouble with Ted about that. Yes, you have to, we have to be very aware of this fact that dimethyltryptamine is a, an illegal drug in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Europe. It is not illegal in, in Latin America or certain countries in Latin America, but it, it is a, an illegal drug, and it is an illegal drug because it is considered to be dangerous. Um, but there is, you know, I, I can't speak about that, but all I know is that all the guys that took dimethyltryptamine during the controlled experiments with Rick Strassman, as far as I'm aware, none have ever had side effects of any description. Mm -hmm. The danger is that it, it changes you completely. I've never taken it, and I never would, because I don't do illegal substances, and I will stress mm -hmm. that. But from people who have told me of having taken the substance, it changes your life. Apparently, you take it, and within 10 to 15 seconds, you are crashing out of your body at super speed. One friend described, he said it was like he crashed out of his chest, and he was flying at supersonic speed, and he suddenly stopped, and he's in this place. And he said it was like clouds, and there were fog all around me, and there were figures moving around in the fog. And what was really disturbing, this friend turned around, and he said, and I suddenly realized that I was back there again. I recognized the place. And he realized that the place he was, he realized that the life he lives now was a dream. The place that DMT took him to was him waking up into the real reality. Again, this guy is a psychologist. He's not just a member of the public. He's a guy that was able to analyze his experience because he was taking it under controlled control conditions. This is how powerful this stuff is. Absolutely amazing. Well, I can see how it could be dangerous for someone who is unaware or if someone who is uh, perhaps uh, driving a motor vehicle, uh, yeah. it wouldn't be very safe. So I think it is important that uh, close wraps are kept upon it then. So, yeah. No, absolutely. It's very important that we are careful about this because if, but if it is generated internally, it suddenly means that it's natural. Right, uh, And indeed, right. They, they did discover, I think it was around 2006, something called the, the trace amine-associated receptors, TARS receptors in the brain. And these are receptor sites that are designed to actually accept the DMT molecule. So already they've found structures within the brain in which DMT, and also, of course, the final thing is I believe that DMT is what creates the near-death experience. Certainly. And, and what is that about? We, we know that a lot of scientists who, who are lagging behind the times, I must say, um, who still believe that, that this is just about brain chemistry and that it's not about uh, reality. But you have another view about that. Yeah, very much to me, we're missing the point. I think one of the, the major issues, for instance, if you, you speak to psychiatrists and psychologists and neurologists of, of the, the materialist reductionist school, i.e. 
the, the consciousness is just an epiphenomenon of the brain. It's an accidental thing of part of evolution. How they can explain how this in, inanimate matter can create consciousness is, is a huge leap, which we're not even vaguely close to doing. But one of the things they turn around and they say is that all these substances do is create hallucinations. Okay? You then, as I ask them, I'll then say to them, okay, define what an hallucination is. And they've got a problem. Because it's called labeling theory. The idea is because we give it a name, we've explained it. It's an hallucination, <laughs> therefore it's explained. It explains nothing. I can call something anything. It doesn't mean I explain it. So to say an hallucination and to say that these chemicals create hallucinations, one could argue that the chemicals in the brain at this moment in time for both of us are creating an hallucination which is called consensual reality by the same logic and by applying exactly the same logic that they apply to hallucinations. So they have to be very, very careful when they make these glib statements this is why people sometimes think I'm a materialist, because I say that the facilitator for this is brain chemistry, because it is. It's a facilitator, but it is a facilitator in the same way that a television set is a facilitator for a TV signal. The television set has a picture of a studio in it with people moving around, but the people and the studio are not in the television set. The television set is processing, wait for it, the electromagnetic radiation of the radio waves but yes, actually yes. then the television set changes the radio waves the light for want of a better term into an image which is what the brain does the brain is a receiver it modulates information in, in fact in many ways there could be a counter argument to say the brain actually attenuates information there's far more information out there and the brain just takes a small section and presents it to consciousness this universe is far more interesting, far more fascinating. And in fact, as a final point, when you were making the point about you being over there in, in, uh, in Washington State and me down here south of London in the home counties of England, the, 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 the issue is that there's this concept called entanglement within quantum physics, as you're probably aware. And it's the idea that all particles, when they're in some form of association, Never forget that association, and they can communicate instantaneously. If one thing is done to one particle, the other one reacts immediately. This, again, is a known scientific fact. In fact, I had a meeting a few years ago with one of Britain's leading, leading quantum physicists, a guy, Professor, Professor Forshaw, Jeff Forshaw. And Jeff turned around to me, and Jeff is, by the way, he's professor of physics at Manchester University, and he has the same position as Rutherford when, because he's professor of physics at the same place that split the atom. Okay, high-duty academic. He turned around to me and he said, over coffee, of course, we know now that every electron in the universe knows the position of every other electron. And they know that because they're all entangled. Or they're all the same electron. It's just we're perceiving one electron as many because of the way we perceive reality. Right. Holographic, just as we are. Awesome. Yep. Hologram's the answer. I think if you start to think holographically and think of the brain as a, a hologram and working holographically, it starts to explain some of the great mysteries like the binding problem, which we won't have time to go into now, but it's one of the big issues of, of modern neurophysiology as to how we have the feeling that everything is happening simultaneously and how everything just seems to happen at this moment in the brain. For instance, when you see a, a red bouncing ball bouncing down the road, you shouldn't be able to see it the way you do because the red is processed in one part of the brain and the bouncing movement is processed in another part of the brain. But we see a red bouncing ball. That's called the binding problem. And scientists have not got a clue as to how that works unless the brain works holographically. If it works holographically, and it's, it's in continual communication. Each section of the brain is always in communication with every other section. And in fact, I've just come across the work of somebody called uh, John Joe McFerrin, I think it is his name. I, forgive, forgive me if I've got his name wrong. But he's a research um, molecular biologist at the University of Surrey. And John Joe believes that consciousness is in the field around the neurons. When a neuron 
sends a message from one end to the other, it generates a very, very small electromagnetic field. There are trillions of neurons, billions of neurons in the brain. All of them create this electromagnetic field. And he believes that's where consciousness is. It's in the electromagnetic field. It's not in the neurons. You won't find consciousness in the brain because it isn't there. Right. It's the machine. It's just a machine. It's a, it's, it's a meat machine, isn't it? Right, isn't it? <laughs> well, Anthony P., once again, you have brought us along on this fantastic journey. Oh, I mean, you've piqued the curiosity of all the listeners, and I know I'm going to get a lot of wonderful feedback. I invite everyone to go out and get the infinite minefield, the quest to find the gateway to higher consciousness, Anthony Peak once again. I thank you so much for joining us, Anthony, and I know that you'll come back, and I know that you're going to have more information, especially about the binding <laughs> next time. Yeah, well, I just thank you for inviting me along tomorrow. It's been, it's been absolutely wonderful just, just chatting to you as it was last time. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, awesome. All right. Well, until next time, I thank all of our members for joining us. And please, make sure that you tell your friends about the fantastic voyages that we get to go on here on Illuminations Media Network. Peace and blessings.